Welcome to Live Well Talk on the Mailbag. The Mailbag is a segment of the podcast where I periodically answer questions from listeners. Uh, our listeners are very intelligent and offer incredibly challenging uh, questions at time. And, and this is, I really enjoy this part. And this is actually our fourth installment of our standalone edition of the Mailbag. And today we'll cover uh, uh, COVID, uh, cancer, uh, colon cancer, and, and more. And as a side note, March is Colon Cancer Month, which we've covered previously. Prior to getting the mailbag and the questions, uh, I think the biggest change in the last week as regard COVID is the CDC changed the masking guidelines, which significantly changed the landscape. And what they did is they, they, they uh, and I think it's a reasonable uh, change, is they looked at hospitalizations and stress on the healthcare system rather than just positive cases. Uh, and I think the Omicron being mild in some patients uh, led to more cases being reported, and that led to a higher uh, community transmission recording. And I think this new uh, guidelines are a relatively big change, but it's had significant positive influence, and, and uh, uh, I, I, I think it was the right decision. Uh, but also healthcare institutions, nursing homes, hospitals, clinics, they are to continue to mask uh, always as if it's still high transmission. It was not involved in that. Uh, that new guideline does not apply. Uh, all right, now for the mailbag. Our first question is from Michael. Can you explain the Omicron BA.2 variant that's been in the news? What is a subvariant, and is this more or less of a concern than the original Omicron? The BA.2 variant. Uh, is just slightly different in Omicron, so it's a subvariant. It doesn't change enough to be get its own Greek letter of the Greek alphabet. Um, and the BA2 is felt to be more transmissible uh, than uh, Omicron was, so it spreads more rapidly or easily can be spread. Um, but at this time, we don't know if it is going to be of significant uh, um, impact to the healthcare system? Is it going to cause increased hospitalizations? Uh, the boosters, we, we, we can say, work protect against Omicron to a certain degree. Will it also protect the BA2 variant? I think they will, uh, but more to come on that. And I, I believe it's in the UK as well as Denmark. They're seeing a lot of BA.2. Uh, I do not have the data for Iowa, but I do know it is in the United States. Good question. Our next question is from Shelby. Uh, after having a Boston Scientific pacemaker with a Medtronic lead installed, why will no hospital give me an MRI for my back? Well, they may or may not. So the, a pacemaker is placed in, in, in the patient and has leads or wires, if you will, that go down the heart to pace the heart. Uh, if the patient has a condition that, that does that also that can shock and we won't get into the details of the pacemaker technology, with the exception, we are going to talk about that some pacemakers are MRI compatible, meaning that you can go in the MRI. And uh, I, I would recommend there's a 1 800 number, I'm sure, for Boston Scientific. You can call that. And we've also put together a protocol in the hospital if someone has an MRI, it needs an MRI, and they have a pacemaker or a defibrillator. Uh, we have a whole protocol established to help that patient. So discuss it with your clinician or do some uh, research on your own to see if Boston Scientific, your particular model, is uh, compatible uh, with the uh, your pacemaker. That's a good question. The pacemaker technology from when I started in medicine is, it's not even comparable. I mean, it's amazing. Our next question is from Kim. As COVID-19 safety measures continue to go away, what are your recommendations for someone who is in a compromise to remain safe while going out about their daily life? I think this gets into to mask or not mask. Uh, if you feel comfortable masking in crowded areas and you're immunocompromised, I think that's very reasonable. Uh, there will be some protection. Uh, additionally, I think uh, an individual that's immunocompromised uh, should always get a flu shot, should uh, be up to date with their vaccines and boosters. And if they have a significant immunocompromised state, there, the CDC has a definition for the high risk, and that is an active uh, treatment for a cancer, 
previous organ transplant, or you're on a medication like for rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease that lowers your body's ability to fight off infections, then those patients also can get a prophylactic monoclonal antibody that's available. Uh, so I think that's the first checklist. And then uh, wash your hands frequently, uh, the other, uh, other uh, things that we've discussed. But I've come to appreciate during the pandemic that air movement has a significant, and which totally makes sense, has a significant uh, influence on the transmission of viruses and particularly airborne viruses. And that circulation of air uh, is significantly influences that transmission and the, the probability of getting sick. Uh, and I think uh, avoiding those circumstances where you're packed in a crowded place without uh, a mask, if you're even a compromise, you may want to avoid those situations. Our last question is coming from Kate. If I'm under the age of 45, but I have had family members diagnosed with colon cancer, can I start screening early since colon cancer is being found more commonly in younger adults? This is a great question. As I indicated uh, uh, earlier in the podcast that March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month, and we have a podcast coming out with Dr. Abramson where he shares some of his insights into colon cancer and other things that he's seen over his career uh, as he begins his retirement uh, here in the month of March. Uh, but it is... 10 years younger than the youngest person in your family to have colon cancer. So if you have a family member, first degree relative that had colon cancer at the age of 32, then you would need a screen starting at 22. If it was 42, then it would be 32. And you can do the math from there. So it's within, it's 10 years. Uh, and that that's the best advice I can get. I, you know, I, I think Dr. Abramson's podcast really talks about colonoscopy screening and and how that uh, should be uh, uh, managed uh, with, between the physician and the patient. And I think people will be uh, listeners will be very happy with that podcast. And once again, we wish Dr. Abramson he was officially retired this week, and we wish him a, a good retirement. Uh, that's all for the mailbag today. If you'd like to submit a question to the mailbag, go to unipoint.org backslash mailbag. I'll answer questions about COVID-19, the latest technologies and procedures, service provided at Unipoint Health, Cedar Rapids, as well as other medical topics. However, as is always stated, uh, it's not a substitution for clinical care. And if you have a personal health issue, you should discuss that with your primary care clinician. Uh, or present yourself to an urgent care, and if it's an emergency, present to the nearest emergency room. If such is not available, uh, go ahead and dial 911 and request emergency services. Uh, once again, uh, you can submit your questions to unipoint.org backslash mailbag. That's unipoint.org backslash mailbag, common spelling a mailbag. I look forward to hearing from you, our amazing listeners. Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.